Okay, good afternoon. My name is Josh Haas with Hamana, the Hawk Migration Association of North America. We're excited for yet another month uh, featuring our Lunch and Learn series. This month, we're excited to welcome Chris Parrish from the Peregrine Fund, um, who has uh, quite a great program planned for us today. Uh, before we get too far along, though, um, I do want to point out that we have our amazing staff member, Julie Brown, online as well. And uh, in terms of some in administrative things, in terms of Zoom itself, don't forget in the upper right hand corner, you can click on view to customize your view exactly uh, how you'd like it. Also, please take note, you'll notice a chat already from Julie. Open up that chat window, which can be done at the bottom of Zoom. Please engage with us. Tell us uh, hello, where you're dialing in from. And remember, as always, this is your way of getting your questions answered. So as you have a question when you're listening to Chris, please feel free to um, put that right into the chat for us. Julie will keep track of those questions and facilitate the questions and answers at the end of Chris's presentation. Additionally, just to note, if you haven't seen on screen already, we are recording this and we'll make this available online at humana.org a little bit later. Uh, you can also go to our news page and see previous Lunch and Learns at any time. We have those out there as well. Lastly, um, along with the recording, please keep in mind that everything gets recorded, including your chats. So please keep that in mind as you're chatting either privately or publicly with those in the participant list. With that, I think that's enough of the administrative bureaucratic stuff. Let's roll into our program. I'm going to turn it over to Julie Brown, who will introduce Chris Parrish today. Thanks, Josh. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about this talk. I think just being a raptor migration focused organization, condors are, are a species that, that don't often get our specific attention at Humana. So, we're excited to have Chris here speaking about all his recovery efforts and, and management of the species. Um, lead poisoning for sure is, is an issue that's on our minds, affects so many species um, in our, you know, just our Humana Conservation and Education Committee has been um, diving into that lately and trying to get more involved. So, so we're happy to be learning more about it today. Um, just a little background on Chris before he starts. Um, Chris was raised in a small farming, ranching, and oil town in South Central California in the Southern uh, San Joaquin Valley. After a brief yet impactful introduction to the wildlife of the desert foothills, mostly through hunting and fishing, he moved on to further his education at Northern Arizona University on an athletic scholarship, obtaining a BS in biology with emphasis on fish and wildlife management. Through time, education, and reflection of the vast gap between the people of the land and conservation-oriented groups like academics and scientists, um, it became obvious that he would strive to bridge the gap between the people of the lands and the scientific management communities in efforts to build intentional and successful conservation products. So after working for the Arizona Game and Fish Department as a wildlife biologist for the first five years of his wildlife career, um, he moved to the private sector and has served as the Condor Program Director for the Peregrine Fund for nearly two decades, um, continuing his passion for both field work and converting foundational scientific contributions to conservation by engaging and uniting partners in recovery efforts in Arizona and Utah. Since 2012, he's been in pursuit of a PhD at Northern Arizona University and also promoted to Director of Global Conservation for the Peregrine Fund with a primary focus on recovery programs for Apomato Falcons, California Condors, and the establishment of the North American Non-Lead Partnership. And as of October, 2021, Chris was promoted to President CEO of the Peregrine Fund. Um, Chris and his wife, Ellen, have two beautiful daughters, Emma and Anna, who are now grown and entering into their careers, taking with them the love and passion of the outdoors and conservation. So take it away, Chris. Wow, thank you. Um, boy, that made me tired listening to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome uh, everybody and, and thank you, Josh, Julie, thank you uh, for having me. 
Um, we have a lot to cover, and and uh, you, you can you'll be able to tell through through the details of my presentation that I've lived the life of condors, um, as, and as a hunter and an angler, lifelong for both of those. Um, the juxtaposition between conservation and uh, our hunting heritage is is a primary goal for me. And when we learned that lead poisoning was the primary impediment to the recovery of the condor, um, we got really excited about how to address that. And it's somewhat unconventional, but I will jump right in. You're going to get a, a basic overview of how we came to know what we know about the relationship between condors as a an obligate scavenger and the lead that's out there in the landscape and what we can do to prevent it and the the approach we have taken in establishing the North American Non-Lead Partnership. So I have a ton of slides to get through, so I'll just jump right in. Um, for those of you, and I saw a few names I saw there who are attending, uh, some of you have probably seen portions of this presentation over the years, and you know that I'm an eternal optimist, but I really like to think about this story, the story of the condor. It's a story of survival for the species, also um, self-awareness, learning about our environment, giving back to future generations and fixing some of the problems we've had a, a had play in, and then dogged determination, whether it's indicative of the species itself and how tough and resilient they are, or the people who work to conserve them in the places they live. You have to first think about where condors came from and the relationship with humans that condors have had, and whether you, um, uh, a, a, whether the Pleistocene overkill hypothesis appeals to you or not, um, we have to imagine that for sure we've had some 25,000 years of change that these condors have experienced. Major changes in climate, extinction of megafauna, introduction of non-native ungulates, and the near extirpation and overharvest of native ungulates, and then this age of conservation we live in where we now have really uh, recovered species of some of those native ungulates to the point where they're in, uh, at harming levels for the, their populations like deer and, and elk. And, and again, that's argued as well. The recent history, however, the condor, those that made it past the extinction of megafauna, and there was a huge reduction in their population at that time, the recent history can really be brought down to these simple few dates and, and numbers. Their near extinction, 22 individuals, of which 13 were the founders of the entire population we have today, which I know someone will ask later about genetic viability and whether or not they, they can have a, a, a bottleneck like that and survive it. And yes, they can. And there are other examples like the Andean condor. But then we move into 1982, just 10 years later, and due to a successful captive breeding program, reintroductions were able to take place, first in California in 92, and then later the Peregrine Fund came on in 1996, beginning to release birds with partners um, in uh, northern Arizona. And then 2017, we approached a world population of over 430, and today we rest, and I need to update that slide apparently, um, today we rest at over 500 individuals total. So the good news is the species has been saved from extinction. The um, less than good news is that they're not self-sustaining yet. A neat testament to the resiliency of, of uh, the condor is a story of AC9, adult condor nine. That was the ninth bird tagged in the history of the recovery effort where each bird was given a, a, uh, an identifier and added into a stud book, which is basically the information about every bird that's produced and what their parentage is and things like that. AC9 was the last condor captured Easter, Easter Sunday, 1987. At that point in time, for all intents and purposes, the condors were extinct in the wild. AC9 was put into captivity in a breeding chamber with a female. They produced young um, every year, which is outside of their norm because usually it's every other year. But in captivity, we can manipulate that to maximize productivity to the point where AC9 was so well represented that someone had the idea that maybe the AC9 should be returned to the wild. Now think about that for a moment. A reintroduce, a, a, uh, sorry, an endangered species that you can have in captivity for that long and then reintroduce to the wild and expect it to survive. Not only did it survive, AC9 repaired and continued to produce young in the wild. This species is terribly resilient. It's not this fragile species that, you know, if, if the most minor thing changes that they go down the tubes. Nature doesn't produce losers. And in this case, what we learned is, is that lead poisoning, and I'll get into that in a moment, lead poisoning is the Achilles heel of the condor. And you'll see throughout the rest of the presentation the numbers that support that if we can address that problem, we can recover the condor. 
The total population, as you can see demonstrated here in linear format in this graph, um, showing the, the growth, again, major kudos and thanks to the captive breeding facilities and the early folks working on this to figure out how to produce them in captivity so successfully that they can be reintroduced into the wild. And of course, continuing to, continuing to reduce re, release birds that can replace those that are lost, giving them that boost they need to reestablish themselves. Condors are long lived species and having such a slow rate of reproduction, any new cause of mortality can really hamper their ability to regain that foothold that they need in order to recover. I have a brief video here just because everybody needs to see this. Uh, if you haven't seen it in person, this, these were birds we released after a day of trapping in the winter when we um, trap the birds up, replace transmitters, um, take blood samples to see if they've had lead exposure. If it's high enough exposure, we can actually treat the birds with chelation therapy. It's a stopgap measure and allows us to tread water, so to speak, to uh, treating those birds, but um, very effective and, and very uh, awe-inspiring. And I won't let this play to the end, but these birds take flight catch the updrafts of the thousand foot cliff off in front of them. And then 28 birds go and soar into that, that horizon line. And I always like to point out to people that those 28 birds in that field of view of this video were more than there were condors in the wild in total. And um, I mean, in total, not just in the wild in 1982. So tremendous strides. And, and I should also mention that we're just one of the release sites and one of the captive breeding facilities. We have partners in California and Mexico and Oregon, um, all working to produce and in some places releasing condors. So we're, we're but one of the, the components of this recovery effort. One of the greatest things about this program, and for me, any kind of uh, ecological studies out there where you focus on one small part of, of the greater system, you learn so much about the greater system. And of course, the on the ground exploits of our biologists in the field and having spent nearly 20 years out there with them was a, a really a, a, what a gift of a lifetime to experience that. But taking us to some wonderful places in southern Utah, northern Arizona, in that Grand Canyon, Zion, Bryce um, region there. One of the other things we have in that landscape, which is a phenomenal thing, is an abundance of food. So while you might think that the condors would have to rely on the natural die, uh, natural deaths of animals like uh, bighorn sheep, mule deer, and elk, we also have tens of thousands of sheep in that southern Utah country, and the condors do quite well there um, about June through October when the sheep are on the mountain because they're in such numbers and uh, sheep aren't the most hardy critters, so it's good business if you're a scavenger. Reproduction in the wild. There were many questions early on in this program. Will they reproduce in the wild because these birds came from captivity? Yes, they will. Not only will they, but tremendously successful. And we've had 49 young produced in the wild since we started the reintroduction in Arizona. And, and we had our first in 2003. But mind you, look at how long it took us. We started releasing birds in 96, and it wasn't until 2003 we had our first successful egg. And we have seven individuals that are of the F2 generation. So wild hatched young producing, producing wild hatched young. And what's terribly interesting about this as well, and it's an anecdote, is that some of the very caves chosen by reintroduced condors to, to uh, nest and, and have young were investigated by park biologists at the Grand Canyon, and they found Pleistocene era remains of condors in those very caves. So the caves that are used by reintroduced condors were once used by their ancestral condors some 25,000 years ago or more. These birds are wide ranging. You can see they're designated by gray. This pretty much captures their home range. It's about an 80 or 90 mile area that they stay in year round. They don't truly have a migration, but we also have had numerous occasions where birds have traveled as far as Southwest Wyoming, out to Colorado, New Mexico, and Southeastern Arizona, and into California and Nevada. So they're a wide ranging species. Most of those extended trips are usually by subadults. Um, I think probably a, a mechanism of dispersal for the species. For our numbers in total, we have 233 birds we've released. We've had 49 hatched in the wild. We have documented 159 birds as dead or missing, and we've returned several to captivity, leaving our wild population today in Arizona and Utah at 111, and again, the world population of now over 500. 
When we look at causes of mortality, you can see here that of the diagnosed causes of death, when we are able to recover a bird because of telemetry, um, we can send those birds in for necropsy and, and have a determination um, given so that we can find out what's happening out there. And you can see that number one, 53% is lead poisoning, confirmed cases of lead poisoning cause death. Predation is a close second. And what I like to point out here, rather than going through the rest, which you can read, I like to point out here that this is both good news and some think bad news. But the good news is lead is a preventable cause of mortality. And if we take that out of that category, predation is the only other major cause of mortality. And as the population has grown and gotten a foothold, if you will, in the landscape, learning how to survive, the young are less vulnerable to predation than those that are released from captivity sometimes. So that's good news. When we do go out and find these birds and we're able to recover them if they've died, we can do the lead studies and we trap the birds annually. And our blood testing annually revealed that there was a spike of extreme lead exposure in November and December, which coincided with the deer hunting season. And like any scientific endeavor, we have our hypotheses, of course, that it may be related to hunting, but then we had to go test that. So a very first question was, where is the lead coming from? And we can also look to the mortality data to determine that. We found in dead, dead birds that have died and confirmed lead poisoning, intact bullets in three cases where a bullet was ingested by the bird prior to its death, lead fragments, as you see here in the picture, in 17 cases, and lead bird shot in seven cases. So 63% of those birds that died of lead poisoning not only had high blood lead levels or tissue lead levels, but also had intact bullets, fragments, and sometimes bird shot. We then looked at the feeding data to see if we could get an idea of where the lead's coming from. And we found that over three years of analyzed data for carcass data, where birds were feeding in the wild on non proffered carcasses, those they found themselves, 53 were deer offal or gut piles, 18 domestic sheep, and then cow, elk, domestic dog. And those use speed readers you see all the way down there, human. Yes, in fact, condors are scavengers and they will eat whatever they can find. And we all probably have read parts of that book, Death in the Grand Canyon. And condors will soon have their own chapter, it seems. Looking into bullet construction and trying to gain a better understanding of where these sources of lead fragments might be coming from, we did a lead study. But before I go there, I like to point out that, hey, I am a lifelong hunter. So this is not me using um, this information as an agenda against hunting. I am a scavenger, a forager, an angler, and a hunter, and lifelong, and so is my whole family. So we had unique insights into this relationship between offal or remains of carcasses left in the field and the uh, what, what condors might encounter or other scavengers. We published our first paper that we started the data collection for back in 2004. It was published in 2006, and it was basically quantifying the number of fragments in carcasses that we'd found in the wild. Um, I'm sorry, that we had uh, killed in the deer that we had shot, and also some that hunters had donated their, their uh, carcasses to be able to be scanned. 100% of the deer shot with lead-based bullets, not surprisingly, contained lead. 74% of those contained more than 100 fragments from a single shot. This blew our minds. And so we were very excited to begin sharing this with our fellow hunters through our agency partners at Arizona Game and Fish and Utah Division of Natural Resources to share with them what we had found. Because while we were all very comfortable with, you know, knowing how much of a bullet is lost after it's shot into an animal, what we failed to realize is where these fragments lie. And if you think about an obligate scavenger entering a carcass, they enter through existing orifices. And if you think about a bullet wound, exit wound or entrance wound, now you have two new orifices where if the bullet fragments, depending on its construction and what it's made of, the highest probability of encountering fragments is through those holes. Really was eye-opening for us and a relatively simple study. Not a lot of statistics here. We shot a bunch of deer. We x-rayed them all the way down to the packaged meat and we quantified the, the fragments in each of those different compartments. 
here's a, a worst case scenario that we found. Actually, this deer we found in the field because condors were feeding on it. And it was not a hunted animal. It was a poached animal. So you have to broaden your thinking beyond just hunting and regulated hunting, but also people that are using ammunition to do illegal activities. And this was a headless deer we had found. And there was a bullet wound through the neck. And we were later able to collect that because the condors are feeding on it and give it an x-ray. And you can see all of that snowstorm effect of fragmentation there. So an in situ example of, of how this lead can get in the environment and how these critters like scavenging condors um, can find it. And then for the gut piles, you can see the fragments. This is a reverse. So it's actually a negative or a positive rather than a negative. And you can see that a um, the, oh, I need to take that CEU code out of there um, <laughs> from my last presentation. Um, you can see those fragments there and it really hard to avoid those fragments if you're a scavenger. We went and took this information to the Arizona Game and Fish Department and asked them to help in sharing this information with their hunting constituents and they did so in the form of a two page spread in their hunting regulations with relevance as to why this lead is of concern and it's because of scavenging wildlife and asking for hunters support voluntarily. This is key. This led to other programs where we worked with some of our tribal partners to get grants to provide free non-lead ammunition so that people could try it. Because like anything in humans these days, we are creatures of habit too. And some people, when you ask them to use a new tool, um, there can be some opposition. So being creative in finding ways to both share the demonstrative effects of, of lead poisoning in, on wildlife, but also sharing a path forward of how we can solve the problem together. You might also know many of you that there were, um, and some people pretty quickly say, well, why don't we just ban it? Well, that was an approach that was taken in California. However, it wasn't taken voluntarily by Cal Fish and Wildlife. It was, uh, it was introduced and uh, imposed by threats of litigation. And um, anyway, enough said on that. But we have a voluntary program in Arizona that's been going on since 2005. And since 2007, for those deer hunters that are directly engaged, about 2,000 of them, 87% annual participation since 2007. I bet many of you haven't heard these statistics because what we hear is condors continually die from lead poisoning. And that is in fact true. But what we were inspired by is when we ask for help, you can get it. This is a small scale program. So therefore it's only four weeks or five weeks out of a, out of a year. Um, and it's only the deer hunters within that region and a few bison hunters. Um, but it really gave us hope that we can establish effective programs and see astonishing rates of, of participation. Utah hunters followed on because of the Department of Natural Resources and their program. They too, in their third year, surpassed that 80% participation and have maintained it in yet again, another small scale program. And then we have the California lead ban, first banned within the range of the condor in 2008, and then in a full statewide ban for all hunting in July, 2019. And the results are, unfortunately, about 50% of diagnosed deaths remain lead caused. So there's no real marked improvement or reduction in lead exposed birds. If you're just using the condor as the indicator, um, we have 40 or 53% in Arizona. And I think they're at 46 or 48% in California. So the point is here that neither lead mitigation effort uh, style of, of approach, whether it be regulatory or voluntary, voluntary has yet to solve the problem for the condor. But I like to remind people that it doesn't mean that change on the landscape is not happening. It means the condors, because they are such a great measurement of lead for those heightened periods of hunting, um, we've yet to see it revealed there. But we, have, we can, of course, extrapolate out and look at the number of clean carcasses or the tonnage of clean carcasses that are made clean by using non-lead or those that are removed from the wild. So we do have some metrics there. What about varmint hunting? What about coyote hunting? What about small game? Tons of studies have come on in, in the last 15 years showing that even fragmentation in very small uh, rimfire ammunition can also be a potential source for scavenging wildlife. And not just scavengers, but also predators who are opportunistic scavengers like eagles. 
Um, we have some studies that we've been doing in New Mexico, as well as some of our colleagues in, in Montana, and some of our just anecdotal putting out cameras on the Kaibab Plateau on gut piles just to see what exactly comes in and feeds on them. And again, there are many of these studies coming online that are in published peer-reviewed journal articles. I just love this one, though, especially for my falconry friends who uh, revere the goshawk as, as this um, high-end predator, which they, of course, are, but they will also take advantage of carrion, believe it or not. So haven't published that as a note, but uh, yeah, some folks, when I told them a, an adult goss was feeding on a gut pile, they said, no. Yes, in fact, they do. Okay, so where do we go from here? And I don't know how much time I've eaten up already. Yeah, about 25 minutes. Um, where do we go from here? We have an awful lot of information from studying one small variable within a greater ecosystem. We have tons of new information and it's very compelling. But what's most important in conservation is not what we know, but what we do with what we know. And of course, like everyone young in my career, I wanted to think we were in a new paradigm of conservation. I think we are. And I think everyone would agree that no longer are the days when you can just produce the science and think that um, people that make policy are going to digest all of the abundance of science out there and make uh, um, the uh, you know, policies that are going to solve the problems. No, to do conservation, we have to shape that. We have to take that science, make it into something that is digestible, and then we have to go out there and actively introduce it to the, base, the different demographics and the publics that are out there. Single species efforts, everyone knows that these, these uh, have, have uh, generated huge uh, debate over the years about, you know, should we really be spending this much money on one species? Well, what I'm pr proud to say and to have been a part of is that by learning so much about the condor in the efforts to save it, we have learned an awful lot about the greater environment and we've learned an awful lot about our behavior and specifically me speaking as a hunter, we've learned how something we've been doing for generations might be threatening wildlife. Not necessarily at a population limiting effect, but for me as a hunter, it doesn't matter. If I know I'm doing something that has extenuating circumstance or extenuating effects on a population and I can change that behavior, I'm encouraged to do so. And that's what we're encouraging other hunters to do. We have to not lose focus and we have to not lose the, the idea of who our audiences are. We might just have non-hunting bird, bird lovers as an audience. We might have bird-loving hunters as an audience. We might have bird-hunting bird hunters as an audience. You have to make sure you're shaping your, 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 um, your presentation to all of those. And it's nearly impossible to do one presentation for all those different demographics. So you have to be, be cognizant of that. And ultimately, what I tell folks is, look, hunters are the ones that can solve this problem. So if you can effectively communicate with hunters and you can share the results of these scientists, scientific inquiries, we can make progress. And we're proving that little by little as we go. And ultimately, it, it does take a village. These things are done in partnership. No one group, not the Peregrine Fund, not the Utah DNR, not the Fish and Wildlife Service. This takes all of these groups to work together in collaboration to synthesize this science and then return it to the public so we can solve these bigger problems. And we decided, since we had seen success in the local small-scale programs in Arizona and Utah, that if we could expand that to a landscape scale and get this information disseminated to, disseminated to all hunters across North America, that we might be able to do even more good, not just for the condor, but for ecosystem health in general. And that's when we founded the North American Non-Lead Partnership. And what we're striving to do is bring together both hunting conservation community members and non-hunting conservation community members together in concert to maintain wildlife and habitat for future generations, because we all seem to share that in common. I might also say that um, preserving our wildlife conservation and hunting heritage, those are the two major tenets of, of the non-led partnership. We know a, we have history in, in having had studies, nearly 100 years of studies, that is, with uh, waterfowl. And in 1991, we all know that it was banned for waterfowl hunting. But you know what's funny about this is most people that I talk to that are not hunters, they say, I thought we did away with lead long ago because they remember the, from the media of when this happened with waterfowl, but they didn't realize there's different types of hunting and different tools of the different types of hunting and how we needed the science to show the effects of lead bullets, in this case, centerfire rifle bullets or rimfire rifle bullets, impacting the animals that are shot and then the remains left in the field could contain lead. So very different from the pellets that were used back in the day with waterfowl. 
most of what we know about lead and its effect in the physiology and, and, and systems of vertebrates is from humans because it's a lot easier to interview humans <laughs> and have uh, uh, to know what humans have been eating than to study wildlife and to know all of those same things. We know that in most vertebrate systems, once consumed, it stays into the body for one to three weeks in the blood, but it can precipitate out of the blood into the organs, into the skeletal system, and that's where it starts to have the effect on the nervous system. Them. So for most vertebrate species, the effects are the same. It's lethargy, uh, motor, motor skills are affected. So imagine what that does to a, a predator like a golden eagle, for example. I mean, are we seeing, and these are great questions where more science can, it can be done, but are we seeing decreased fitness in some of these birds and increased collisions because they're not, um, you know, they're having neural disruptions from lead poisoning? These are now questions that are being asked to the point of examining those birds that die of other causes of mortality to determine what role lead might be playing there or to at least ask that question. Most of what we know about identifying exposure and exposure in wildlife is through blood samples, lead sam or feather lead samples, radiographs like those x-rays I showed you. And then um, if, a, if a bird or a species dies, if they are tested even, which is only of, of, of recent that a lot of raptors are tested and the testing is expensive. So you can imagine how slow this has been to turn it on and really assess the, the, the impact that lead plays. Um, just because it's new knowledge. So it's being worked into raptor rehab centers, for example, are looking into doing more testing of lead for birds that come in from any causes of mortality. But in a dead bird, we can look at organ lead levels, bone lead levels, and feather lead levels. Okay, now the most important part of this, how do we transfer this information to the hunting community so that we can see, um, see the change necessary to solve the problem? It's sometimes as simple as pictures. And just like those pictures of the fragments in a gut pile or in a whole deer, pictures like these help to shape the path of understanding of where ed can, lead can be uh, unnecessarily introduced into the food chain, where scavenging wildlife can then eat it. And then, of course, there, is, there are extensive studies out there looking at the difference of terminal performance of lead versus non-lead. And I can tell you for sure that 10 years ago, there were major questions as to whether or not non-lead bullets and rifle bullets would even work. But studies like these showing the difference in, differences in wound cavity of lead on the left and non-lead on the right and the disruption of tissues, you can see by the... By the, the the, the uh, circumference at the beginning where it's a little, little larger all the way down into where the bullet terminates and stops. And you can see also those fragments there. And then you can see non-lead on the right um, and where the fragments sometimes are for there. And it's not that non-lead bullets do not fragment, they just tend to fragment much less. And of course they don't contain lead and lead is what these birds are, are suffering from. We know through, um, again, you look at that mushroomed bullet on the left, if you're a hunter and you've ever recovered a bullet from a carcass, that's what you see. And when you see that, you think, wow, oh, the bullet did its job. But what we never saw were these fragmentations. I mean, these fragments. And some of these fragments were so small that you would never see them with the naked eye, even if it's all the way down into the ground meat, which I know someone will ask later, so I'll say it now. Yes, we've quantified the rates of fragmentation all the way down to packaged meat. And yes, about 32% of the packages of meat that we analyzed from our second study contained lead. Um, is it of worry? I think that's a personal decision and I'll let the medical experts answer those because we've been accused of, of fear mongering and scaring people. And we're not trying to scare people. We're trying to give them enough information so they can make informed decisions. We're not policymakers, we're scientists. Here's the non-lead bullet and you can see sometimes they fragment, maybe one or two petals uh, might come off of that bullet, but um, they expand to about double their size. They're very effective in taking animals as humanely as with lead ammunition. Um, but again, 20 years ago, it was a relatively new product. Today, every major manufacturer's Every major manufacturer has a non-lead bullet in most calibers, but availability is a huge problem today because ammunition shortage is everywhere. So now into the formation of the partnership, the Peregrine Fund, the Institute for Wildlife Studies, and the Oregon Zoo were the founders. And of course, we have tons of other partners. 
But the way we approach this is we connect our research with our existing values and show the benefits of using that information to guide ourselves in how we work on, upon the landscape, whether we're a hunter or we're a scientist. We also understand that if done poorly, there's a backfire effect. And this effort, um, not only ours, but others, have been coined as attacking the right uh, gun rights, believe it or not. So you have to be very careful um, that you don't have that backfire effect because you can have the best intentions. And if you present it in the wrong way, it can be perceived as one step closer to banning hunting. Um, but that's another discussion altogether. So the process um, that we use at the partnership is much the same as the process I would use in talking to my hunting friends. Phase one is we initiate that conversation. So this is whether it's an agency, a sports group, or an individual hunter. First, you have to initiate the conversation. And then you have to share information and allow time for absorption and consideration of that new knowledge. And again, new knowledge, believe it or not, as excited as we are about science and the impact it has on our lives as humans, um, if it's bad news, boy, it has a little, little uh, takes a little longer for it to have an effect. Phase two is when we re-engage and revisit the notion with individuals or groups, and then hopefully we join up and, and we join in partnership. And phase three, when we partner, we start to build and implement programs to share this information with their constituents, whether it's a management agency or a sports group, and we begin to then build and implement programs to share information and encourage the use of non lead or encourage the removal of leaded carcasses on the, on the landscape. And then hopefully we've done our, our due diligence in evaluation by identifying metrics to track so we can see if we are making progress with our tactics to engage the target audiences and if it's working and if it's not to refit and reform until we see that success. In 2018, when we launched um, we had what I guess I would call a blitzkrieg of, of uh, outreach effort, drove over 115,000 miles in 15 months in doing uh, non-lead workshops and engaging with individual states and individual wildlife agencies. Um, of course, we had the experience of Arizona Game and Fish, Utah DNR, and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife were early early uh, signers on the, the partnership, but we've since added a few more states and we've done um, engagements at the invitation of these state agencies. And we should also include New York in there, but I failed to find their logo quickly enough to add it. Um, but New York, Maine, Vermont, Louisiana, those were all states we added um, here in the last year and a half, even during the pandemic. There are three ways you can join the partnership and there's these are what the different levels of partnership mean. In some cases, whether it be a sports group or a hunting group specifically, they might say, well, we don't wanna join the partnership, but we definitely appreciate the way in which you're engaging on this issue. So we support your methodologies and your philosophies. So they'll allow us to put their, their name on there. They sign the resolution and uh, they're stated in support of partner. Then we have a supporting partner. And then finally, a full partner. And a full partner is gonna help shape a program within a specific region and or a specific area within a specific state and also provide monetary support. We don't have a schedule, a fee schedule, if you will. Um, we have many partners that don't have money to contribute, but they can sure help us in, a, in accessing their constituents and sharing this information with them, just like we're doing today. Here's the, the three um, partners in addition. Oops, let me back up there. Sorry, um, we don't have Washington State on there. We just signed Washington State. So we have four state fish and wildlife agencies uh, as, as signatories and as full partners. Um, or one of them's a, a supporting partner, but uh, anyway, partners nonetheless. And then you can see here by this cadre of other partners on here, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple because we're up to 40 now. And so we're starting to have to overlay them. But you see there are a lot of hunting groups on there and that's by design. And there aren't a lot of conservation groups that aren't tied to hunting or wildlife management agencies. And that's by design. We're trying to build this from the constituency of the target audience, which is hunters, those who, and where hunters get their information. So you can see there are some podcasts on there. There's even, even a camouflage clothing company um, that has a conservation arm, First Light, and they are a partner as well. And they've helped us to get information out um, through, through their constituents. We also have developed hunting, uh, non-lead hunting education models. 
um, my, my colleague and co-founder Leland Brown at the Oregon Zoo. Um, he created this wonderful module um, with funding from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife that educates both experienced and new hunters about the effects of lead and the pathways of lead and how to avoid that. We've done a ton of podcasts. Randy Newberg, I have to give special thanks to him. He's had us on his podcast where we went into the in-depth uh, information from both our science and our proven strategies in these small scale programs. And Randy has been fantastic there. And I'll skip through the, the details. Boone and Crockett Club, while they're not a partner, we've engaged with them um, um, pretty extensively, sometimes more recently to their invitation. But look at their statement on, on uh, lead and ammunition for hunting and shooting. Um, we've seen a lot of progress in the language that's being used today and the way people are talking about this. So I encourage you to educate yourself and take a look at these. Um, another podcast we did with Hal Herring and another partner with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And basically um, our website, we're not trying to reinvent any wheels. One of our other um, longtime partners and co-founders, Institute for Wildlife Studies, has a website that has a lot of in-detail information. The partners, nonledpartnership.org is simply just listing our partners, what the differences in partnership mean, some videos and links to videos and podcasts, and uh, of course the initial news of our launching. Um, fairly remedial, but it does capture all of our partners. So you can take a look at that. And of course our contact information is on there as well, should you want to, to engage further whether you know somebody that could use a presentation or you know a potential funder who might be interested in funding these types of programs. I will say that other than a few grants, um, I've been really blessed at the Peregrine Fund that we've operated the last few years on unrestricted funding, which in the non-led or non-nonprofit world is uh, kind of a no-no. But um, they believed in it enough to let us do this, and we're now seeing partners coming on with some funding, and so we're looking to expand this in a real way across the U.S. And with some of the notable partners of the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies are both partners now, and we're working to develop funds to provide regional specialists in those areas to help carry this messaging and do more of these outreach events to help shape the path towards solving that eventual problem. I will say at the last slide, if you notice this, um, we're, we're pretty thoughtful and maybe we're a little slow because we're so thoughtful, but if you look at this logo, it took us a lot of deliberation and creativity, but the back of that that you see in the middle, which is the gold part or the brass color, is the back of a bullet. And at the primer of a bullet, which is what you impact with the firing pin that ignites the gunpowder that pushes the bullet down range, that primer, we believe, is both, uh, it, it exists because of future hunters and prior hunters and that conservation ethic that we're so proud of as hunters. So they're at the primer. And then on both sides, we see representations of the raptors that a lot of our studies come from. And of course, the critters that we choose to hunt for our sustenance and, and some for, for uh, sport, but we'll, we'll leave that uh, debate to another place as well. Uh, it's all linked together in partnership. So this is a partnership where we're trying to deliver the products of our scientific efforts and convey it in a way that it results in real and lasting change to solve a preventable problem that benefits not only a species like the condor, but also other scavenging, scavenging wildlife. And with that, I will end, and boy, did I run farther than I had expected. So I'll skip that last slide and um, stay on this one for any time that we have in questions, but I will end it with reminding you that Species survival is something and nature doesn't produce losers. And oftentimes when we see a drastic decline in any species, we need to look into it and find out just what's going on. And here's another example of that with the condor. And if we address this lead issue successfully, I think we will see a recovered population. The self-awareness, the giving back and the dogged, dogged determination, anybody in conservation knows those are things you have to have to be successful. So. Thank you for the, the time. And I know I've gone about 15 minutes farther than I had hoped and uh, don't wanna keep people past their lunch hour too long, but I'll stand by for questions if we have time. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chris. Wow, that, that, was, that was amazing. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and I think we're good on time. We definitely have some time for questions. Um, a few have come in, a few um, sent me 
questions directly, so I can jump in. Um, but just thank you for all this important work you're doing. It's I'm I'm I applaud you for all the outreach you've been able to do. Um, it's pretty impressive, and and I was blown away by you know some of your um, just getting hunters on board and and the response you've had. I'm I'm pretty impressed with that seventy or eighty percent or more um, response. I know just working. You know, I used to do research with loons and, and getting anglers on board here in the Northeast with, with lead is, is such a challenge. And it sounds like you're, you're making some incredible progress. So that's great. Um, we have a few questions. Um, the first, um, what are non-lead bullets um, actually made of? Great question. Probably should have included that in my presentation. Um, it, depending on the bullet type, the most common for um, center fire rifle bullets is copper. Um, there are different types of, of compounds that are made with, with nickel. And anyway, the primary one is copper because it's, it's um, less expensive than some of the, the more dense non-lead options and it's easier to work with. Um, but now I'm speaking way out of turn there because there, there are experts out there that can tell you more. But copper is what's most commonly used. And then in the smaller bullets, there are co uh, combinations of copper, tin, tungsten, bismuth, uh, and, and I don't know what all the recipes are, but mostly copper for center fire rifle bullets for the ones that they call monolithic. However, there are fragmenting bullets because in some cases a hunter wants a fragmenting bullet and there are non-lead alternatives out there, although they're more rare and harder to find um, that are made of those other compositions. Okay, thanks. Um, so Liza is asking um, if a condor ingests lead, can it stay in the stomach for more than mm. weeks and keep raising the lead level? Absolutely. And we've seen that. And it's it's unknown. We have a lot of theories as to why some fragments pass more quickly than others. And we can we can feed the birds different types of uh, roughage, like more fur and more skin, because condors, like like other raptors, can regurgitate a pellet of non-digestible portions. And sometimes that can be captured. Those fragments can be captured in those pellets that they, not to be confused with lead pellets, these are pellets of cast material that most raptors cough up, just like the owl pellets. Um, so sometimes you can get it out of there, but given that the condor doesn't have the, it doesn't gravel to, to use that, it's still a muscle in its gizzard, but it's a pH. The pH is really the key. And that acidity is what helps to more rapidly break down everything, including the lead. So if that fragment stays in that high pH um, or that highly acidic environment, it can continually be assimilated into the body and through the bloodstream, into the vascularized tissues, then to the organs, then to the bones and brain. And it's an increasing difficulty to get rid of it once it's stored in those places. For example, the half-life in, in lead in, or in blood lead is about 14, 17 days. The half-life in bone and brain can be as much as 40, 30, 40 years. So the quicker you can get it out of there, the better. And it's it's um, it's unique to each case as to how quickly those pellets can be passed. When we're treating a bird in captivity that has a fragment or a pellet in its digestive system, uh, in the in the gastrointestinal system, um, we monitor it via x-ray and we chelate. We do chelation therapy, which helps to remove the lead from the bird's bloodstream um, uh, while it's being assimilated into the, the system. Okay. Um, next question for you is from Peg. Um, she asks, do you find that hunters are willing to take gut piles with them rather than leave them behind? Yes, I will say that the bison hunters are a little more hesitant for obvious reasons, <laughs> but no, that and sense. that's where I have to give my hats off to, to programs out there for the Arizona Game and Fish Department to Utah Division of Wildlife. You know, they offer incentive programs because it might take you 10, 15 years to draw a tag. And if you're not familiar with these non-lead bullets and, and you've not used them and you don't have confidence in them, it's hard to get people to, to, to be convinced to try something new when they finally draw that tag. So that's where we've been very creative in establishing programs whereby we incentivize the hauling out of the gut pile. And if it's a deer, it's a little easier and say, hey, if you bring us your gut pile, you still participated in an action that decreased the threat of lead exposure to wildlife. And we wanna, we wanna reward that.
that. So we have drawings for prizes like uh, Navajo Nation donated an elk hunt, which is a coveted tag, and it incentivized people bringing in their gut piles. So yes, hunt, some hunters are willing to do that. Others say, I'm not touching that. I'm not. I'm once I'm done with gutting the animal, I'm done with it. But I'll use non-lead to help you out. So many different ways to help um, avoid that potential threat. Great. Um, Joanne is asking, uh, why don't hunters use non-lead bullets? Are they more expensive? Sometimes they are. If you're comparing like products, like high quality, um, what people would call, um, you know, uh, uh, what's the, I forget the labeling they use for uh, precision ammo. Anyway, higher end ammunition, whether it's lead or non-lead is the same price. But if you compare non-lead ammunition at a mid-level with the least expensive lead, there can be a huge cost disparity. But I say huge, $5 per box of bullets. Um, but the main reasons most hunters don't more hunters don't use non-lead is they're unfamiliar with the problem and they're unfamiliar that using non-lead is a solution and they're unfamiliar with non-lead bullets because they're relatively new. So um, it's not that they're opposed to it oftentimes and our overwhelming response when we do um, outreach events and we do workshops is after we present our findings and then we present potential solutions, the overwhelming response is I had no idea and another common response is, I thought this was just a bunch of malarkey and people were attacking my rights to hunt. So right. information is the problem here, but knowing better is not doing better. You still have to facilitate and shepherd that process of transitioning to these new products and new practices. You can't just know better. I mean, if that were the case, I wouldn't weigh nearly 300 pounds because I know that <laughs> equation. Uh, I eat more than I burn, yeah. Yeah, education for sure. It That's really the shows the value. Um, Mary, Mary's asking, is the federal duck stamp program and distribution used as a pathway for communicating with hunters and others about lead-free bullets? No, not the duck stamp program in particular, but I will say that there's been substantial movement in using Pittman-Robertson dollars, which is something a lot of people aren't familiar with, believe it or not, and that is the excise tax dollars on arms and ammunition that go to conservation, that go back to the states and pay for conservation. Traditionally, it's not been used for things like wildlife health, but where it comes to hunter education, it is used, and in some states, some of those funds that are provided by hunters for conservation is being those funds are being used in some cases to hone this outreach and education material where it pertains to hunting with non-lead bullets or with lead bullets. So yeah, many great programs there. And I think for non-hunting folks, um, they, they don't realize the impact. And with all the ammunition purchasing that's happened, both from uh, changes in presidents to uh, the uh, COVID and all the ammunition sales going through the roost, that's provided tremendous funding in the Pittman-Robertson Fund. So, and recreational shooting is more of that than hunting. And that's mm -hmm. brings up another question. People say, well, why don't we just go to all non-lead? Well, there's a reason that that's not a great solution because only eight to 11% of ammunition produced is used for hunting. Mostly it's for recreational shooting. So there are a lot of devils in the details there. And so if we went to all non-lead for recreational shooters, um, that would be terribly expensive one, and it's harder to come by too. And, uh, you know, we, for the partnerships perspective anyway, and I know there are issues that people have with shooting ranges, but having it controlled in areas where the shooting is happening, there, there are remediation possibilities for those shooting ranges. So using lead there is not like putting it into the food chain by having it be in the food sources that these scavengers consume. Hmm. Okay. Um, and Jill's following up another question you kind of touched on. When hunters get their tags, is lead free bullet information given to them? So, you yes, not only information, but in some cases, like on the Kaibab Plateau, um, the Arizona Game and Fish, they give out a free box of non lead ammunition for every tag holder that draws a tag. They are offered a coupon for a free box of ammunition as a goodwill testament of encouraging them to try it. In Utah, they do it a little bit different, but if you purchase it and you provide your proof of purchase and show that you're a legal drawn tag hunter, you can send that in for reimbursement of up to almost, in some cases, more 
more, in some cases, a little less uh, than a box of ammunition. But there are different strategies in different regions. And we're trying to develop a strategy nationwide so people can be aided in making that transition. So if it's a cost issue, issue we can address that. If it's a familiarity issue, that's where we do the workshops and share the information with hunters to show them which am ammunition works with which firearms and all of that. Establishing that network of hunters across the nation will help raise the awareness and understanding and hopefully um, hone that to the point where there are fewer barriers to entry of using non-lit. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Uh, we're getting towards, towards the end here. Um, Eric is asking, um, isn't the lead poisoning problem also present in other predators who scavenge like wolves and bears, et cetera? Great, great question. And um, it all is related to how the, the systems of those different scavengers work. So for mammalian scavengers or animals that scavenge, it's not as much, it seems based on the studies today, not much as much of an issue it is, is with avian scavengers. And it's much to do with their physiology, the frequency of feeding, things like that. So um, of the studies I've seen, they've documented increasing lead levels, but not deleterious effects from those lead levels in other species. But you really have to be careful and ask the question, do we do we know as much as we know because of the amount of study in each avian versus mammalian species? And therefore, can we say it is or is not a problem? So I rest and say that, that there are fewer studies there. Um, it hasn't been shown to be as deleterious, especially not as much as it is with condors, because with condors, it is affecting their population at a population level. And we can know that because we actually tag every bird produced in the wild and we tag every bird released. So we can really say something definitive about a population of condors. But of course, we cannot do that as easily for bald and golden eagles. But some of you may have seen the study that came out in science a few weeks ago from our colleagues, uh, Vince Slaby and Todd Katzner, where they were able to document through a, a analysis on a landscape scale that lead is having an impact of 3.8% uh, reduction in potential growth of bald eagles, and I think close to 1% with uh, golden eagles. So um, again, more the more we know, the more we can say, but uh, yeah. with respect to other predators and scavengers, um, that's what I know. Okay, great. Um, and one more question, uh, maybe two more, if you have time, we're at 1256 I think I'm here. Good. Okay. Um, Dana is wondering, have you ever done programs for education using live non-releasable raptors, which are licensed by many wildlife rehabilitators for uh, visual aids? Absolutely. Absolutely. At the Peregrine Fund at our World Center for Birds of Prey, we have birds and, and when we travel, well, when we can travel and have birds or when we um, reach out to our, our falconry community, which they also have birds and to the rehab community. Yeah, having birds out there, it, it's amazing the response that we see when we have uh, even and I shouldn't say it this way, but um, you know, one of the most common species out there, red tail, you have a red tail on the fist and you're talking about lead and scavenging wildlife. And they say, well, how does that eagle relate to this? And it's like, well, this is a red tail, but um, <laughs> this is a good first step. And how it relates that if we, um, like I did as a kid when I was shooting ground squirrels because my grandfather paid me to, because they were a problem with our canal and levee systems and he wanted them gone. So I shot ground squirrels. Well. Had I been doing that with lead, which I was, and this red tail that you have on your fist came to consume one and happened to eat one of those bullets or the fragments from it, it could have affected them. I had no idea because I was ignorant. So having them on the fist definitely helps. It's a little harder to travel with them, but developing a larger network of folks who have them. So when we make these presentations, whether it's at a sports show or um, a convention or something like that, yes, we do use that. It's terribly effective. Yeah, great way to connect people. Um, okay, and, and just lastly, you had mentioned predation um, early on. What is, what is the main predator for a condor? Oddly enough, it's coyotes and golden eagles. Yeah. Okay. And and usually in the coyote cases, it's it's usually because it's an inexperienced bird. And of course, look at what we're asking these young birds that we produce in captivity to do. You know, in a normal situation, they would be in the nest for six months and the parents would tend to that youngster for the year following. So there's an awful lot of parental care. And that chick usually spent its first six months in a cave 
So it's very comfortable at altitude, not on the ground. And of course, the parents don't spend time on the ground, so they don't see that. So the relationship of, you know, are they teaching or are they just, they, their probability for encountering a coyote is much less for a bird produced in the wild. You release a new release and its first flight out in the wild takes it to the valley floor and it decides to spend the night there, it's much more vulnerable to coyote predation because coyotes are out doing what they do at night and they're good at what they do. So that's one explanation and I'm oversimplifying it, but we do things like um, trying to haze the birds from those areas that are accessible to ground dwelling predators. And uh, it's shown positive in teaching the birds that it's not a safe place to be. But we didn't do that at the beginning. At the beginning, we released birds and said, let nature take its course. And then we realized how disadvantaged these young birds were that were produced in captivity. And there are other things that are being done in captivity that really help, like increasing the number of perches in the pins when they're in captivity so that they're able to do what they're genetically and, and evolutionarily programmed to do and not being on the ground except while feeding. So yeah, a lot of, uh, I went off on terrible tangents there. And the other thing is, is the uh, awareness of golden eagles, you know, um, even people, I like to say, if you go through a nesting habitat of a, a territorial eagle at the right time of year, um, they'll come and, you know, give you heck as well. So if an unsuspecting condor that is brand new to the area goes flying through there, sometimes it's defense of a territory, but sometimes it's the other way around where condors were, will escort golden eagles out of their nesting area. So it goes both ways. And I think it's just a steep learning curve when we're reintroducing a species that didn't have any of its own kind there to, to model its behavior by by being with that population. Now that we're reintroducing birds into an existing healthy population, um, we're seeing less of that, but it's not that it can't happen. We just, they, they, they learn a little more. You know, if everybody leaves from a carcass and flushes and a coyote shows up, the last one to leave is probably the one that gets the message. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, well, well, thank you so much, Chris, for this wonderful presentation. There's a lot of, a lot of comments coming in from people who are just really um, impressed and, and so interested in this talk. So thank you for taking the time to, to um, educate us on this program. Um, Josh, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, I just want to echo my appreciation as well, Chris. It was a wonderful presentation. We got similar positive feedback from our followers on Facebook. Uh, for those um, interested in seeing this again, we'll have this up on the Hamana.org website, uh, specifically the news section uh, soon. Um, if you are uh, not willing to wait, uh, you can certainly go to our Facebook videos page and view it there as well. Uh, we are working on a topic and a speaker for April. We don't have that fully lined up yet, so we don't have uh, that to market today. Uh, but we will have that to you shortly, and you'll, you'll hear about that via our e-news or on Facebook. So make sure to follow. Again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, Chris, to uh, take the uh, opportunity to be with us and speak to our constituents today. Uh, for those online, thank you so much for joining, and we wish you the best. We will see you in a month. So thank you again and uh, have a great day.